So welcome everyone. Today we're going to be talking about uh, GWAS mechanism. So we're uh, expanding on the lecture that we had last time to now look at global variables such as epigenomic enrichment, to look at EQTLs or expression quantitative trait loci, and to study mediation and causality. And we're going to have a guest lecture by Professor Yongjin Park from University of British Columbia. So uh, we're going to review briefly GWAS and fine mapping and locus mechanistic dissection. And then we're going to look at different methods for global enrichment analysis using epigenomics to infer tissues of action, regulators, cell types, and target genes. Then we're going to look at EQTLs or expression quantitative trait loci and mediation to understand the intermediate molecular phenotypes through which the genetic variants are acting ultimately on disease. And then we're going to look at a workhorse of genome-wide association studies and also of EQTLs, which is linear mixed models, looking at both mixed effects and random effects, both fixed effects and random effects, and how these can mix together to uh, carry out the ultimate prediction of phenotype. Then we're going to look at polygenic risk scores and how we can sum over all variants and you know many modifications of that for predicting phenotypes. And then uh, we're going to look at heritability. And uh, you know, somewhere around here, we're going to transition to the guest lecture. And we're going to co cover the remaining topics on the Thursday lecture, right before a guest lecture by Alkis Price. So uh, let's dive right in. <clears throat> so what we talked about last time is, uh, number one, the trade-off between a small number of variants with large effects and very, very many variants of small effects and how Mendelian analysis are mostly capturing these very strong effect variants, whereas genome-wide association studies are capturing primarily common variants, which are by nature mostly non-coding and mostly weak effects. Otherwise, they would not rise to high frequencies. So there's an in inherent selection against common strong effect variants in the human population, leading to this um, dichotomy between Mendelian variants that are not, quote unquote, allowed to rise to, to high frequencies, and then common variants that are uh, not allowed to be high effect size. We also talked about how uh, common variants, in fact, fall in haplotype blocks, where a particular common variant is co-inherited with many, many other common variants in the same block, making it difficult to infer which of the sometimes hundreds of variants is in fact the causal one when we find an association of this block with disease. And we saw an example of a mechanistic dissection of a non-coding association, starting with uh, establishing what is the tissue and cell type of action uh, based on these epigenomic enrichments that we're going to talk about more today, predicting target genes using EQTLs that we're going to talk about more today, inferring the causal nucleotides using Bayesian fine mapping that we're going to talk about more today, and inferring the upstream regulators using regulatory motif enrichments and the cellular and organismal phenotypes, and how we could apply all of these to the FTO locus, the strongest genetic association with obesity, to infer the circuitry. And once we have the circuitry, to be able to actually manipulate the circuitry in order to reverse the disease phenotypes. So today we're going to dive into some of the global methodologies that enable us to do these types of inferences across thousands of genetic loci simultaneously. So we're going to look at methods for global enrichment analysis to predict disease relevant tissues, regulators, cell types, and target genes. So again, our goal is to understand these Manhattan plots, to basically uh, look at what are the functional drivers, what are the mechanistic bases behind every one of those peaks. And what's really exciting here is that because we're not studying one peak at a time, we don't have to just say, okay, we're going to first study the FTO locus, and then we're going to start, go and study that locus in isolation, and then this locus in isolation, and then that locus in isolation. Instead, what we're going to do is say, what is common across all of these loci 
And by studying them jointly, we will be able to infer properties that can then allow us to go back in any one of these loci and utilize these properties. In other words, if we find that across all of these loci, there's an enrichment for overlap with adipocyte enhancers, then among the many variants in one locus that are overlapping uh, many different types of enhancers, we might say, aha, the one that overlaps adipocyte enhancers is more likely to be the causal one because I see this property globally across all of these loci. Okay, so who's with me see, you know, here so far on this concept of using common global properties to learn something that cuts across all these loci and then use that something to go back into individual loci and see how it applies to those loci. Great, so we're at 61, 35, 4, 0, 0. So, the goal, of course, of genetics is that we're going to have some unbiased, causal, and uh, uncorrected views of disease, and that we're going to use that to look at disease mechanisms, predict target genes, therapeutics, and personalized medicine. The challenge of mechanism is that in the vast majority of these regions, there are no protein coding alterations. And that's a feature of genome-wide association studies that specifically look for common variants and a feature of complex traits where they are really governed by thousands of weak effect variants. And those variants are primarily non-coding. So that means that the target gene is not known, the causal variant is not known, the cell type of action, the pathway, and the mechanism is not known. So what we're gonna be leveraging in today's lecture is all of these data sets for epigenomic annotations of cell circuitry, and all of these deep learning models for predicting which motifs, uh, which motif disruptions are more likely to have a phenotypic consequence, and what target genes are uh, altered in expression when changing these variants and so on and so forth, and a lot of these high throughput validation studies that we're going to talk about later in the term. So the key idea is going to be the following. We're not going to be looking at only one location at a time. We're going to be looking at all of the genetic association, the genetically associated regions simultaneously. So we're going to be studying for example, all of the genetic variants associated with height, all of the genetic variants associated with type 1 diabetes, with blood pressure, with cholesterol, and so on and so forth. And the key idea is that these traits can serve as controls for each other, that by looking at the differences between the enrichments of height and those of type 1 diabetes and those of blood pressure and those of cholesterol, we're going to be learning something that is not simply a common property, property of long haplotypes that might be more frequently associated with disease and so on and so forth. So for each of these traits, we're going to be looking at global overlap across all of the loci with different epigenomic annotations. And when you look at all of the genetic variants associated with height and you ask, are they frequently overlapping enhancer annotations in that are active in stem cells, then you will see an enrichment here, but not for the other ones. And same thing with type 1 diabetes, we're going to ask what is the global overlap between genetic loci associated with type 1 diabetes and immune functions, blood pressure. We're going to find that the genetic variants associated with blood pressure are overlapping with enhancers active in heart. Genetic variants associated with cholesterol are overlapping enhancers active in liver, and so on and so forth. So for every trait, we're going to find all the associated regions at some p-value threshold. We're going to take all of the SNPs, all of the single nucleotide polymorphisms within the credible interval, which we usually uh, use R squared greater than 0.8. So that goes back to this picture here, where we're trying to find a global enrichment between this locus and that locus and many, many other loci that are disease associated but we don't know which variant within this region is the driver one. So we're just simply gonna consider all of the SNPs 
within a, a credible interval and then look for an enrichment across all of those that are jointly selected. Okay, we're going to consider all of the steps in the credible interval and then we're going to evaluate the overlap between those SNPs and tissue specific enhancers. And we're gonna keep the tissues that show some kind of significant enrichment. And we're gonna evaluate that enrichment using a hypergeometric statistic, a binomial statistic, some kind of probability given the fraction of all SNPs that that enhancer annotation covers. And therefore the fraction we would have expected by chance versus the fraction that we find to actually overlap that trait. And then we're gonna repeat for all traits, which are gonna be the rows of our matrix and for all columns and for all cell types and tissues, which are gonna be the columns of our matrix, okay? So when we do this, what we find is that the genetic variants associated with all of these different traits show very tissue specific enrichments across all of the enhancers active in those tissues. So I showed you previously the example of height where the genetic variants associated with height enrich specifically in enhancers um, active in embryonic stem cells, genetic variants associated with a lot of immune traits enrich specifically in T cell and B cell enhancers. Blood pressure variants uh, are enriching specifically in enhancers active in the left ventricle and so on and so forth. Okay, so I'm gonna stop there and see who's with me so far on how we carry out these global enrichments to look effectively for properties that will then allow us to go and in interpret any one disease locus in isolation. Okay, so we're at 67%, 29, 0, 0. This is great. Um, so there are sometimes surprises. So for example, we were surprised to see that Alzheimer's disease was not globally enriched for enhancers active in brain. And instead, Alzheimer's was enriched for enhancers active in monocytes, in CD14 plus cells. And what we found in fact, is that there's two different components of Alzheimer's. There's an immune component of Alzheimer's that is activated very early. And then there's a neuronal component of Alzheimer's that is repressed very late in the disease progression. And the fact that the enrichment for Alzheimer's was sitting very specifically in the CT14 plus cells told us that it probably has something to do with the microglia. These are also marked by CD14. This is a cell surface marker of both circulating macrophages and the of both circulating monocytes and the tissue resident macrophages, including the microglia that are specialized macrophages of the brain. And that basically told us that instead of acting primarily in neurons, what Alzheimer's genetic variants probably do is act first in immune cells of the brain. And then that led us to actually postulate this, you know, many years ago. And we have found time and again, more and more evidence that indeed genetic variants appear to be acting primarily in immune cells first rather than neuronal cells, okay? So that allows us to now start clustering all of these enrichments between different tissues in the circles here and different traits in the boxes, in the rounded boxes, enabling us to, for example, look at cholesterol in liver, ulcerative colitis, which is an inflammatory bowel disease, which are both in, uh, implicating both immune processes and digestive tissues, heart repolarization with left ventricle, height with embryonic stem cells and fibroblasts, and then Alzheimer's sitting here among the immune uh, traits, but specifically with monocytes rather than any of these circulating uh, adaptive immune cells. Okay, so uh, we can now start using this information in a Bayesian framework to go back and say, which of the genetic variants that are associated with disease are more likely to be functional. So what we're gonna use is um, uh, a Bayesian approach that allows us to say, um, if I have 
a set of epigenomic annotations that are global, I can use the enrichment that I have observed as an empirical prior that allows me to say that in absence of any GWAS evidence for this one locus, I'm going to expect that the SNPs that overlap, let's say, enhancers in immune cells are more likely to play roles in Crohn's disease or in Alzheimer's. So that gives me the prior. Or conversely, if I find that genetic variants associated with schizophrenia are enriched in the central nervous system, that again gives me a strong prior that if a SNP overlaps a um, central nervous system enhancer, it is more likely to be the causal SNP, okay? Everybody here uh, with me on how we're taking these enrichments and then turning them into priors so that when we have multiple SNPs in a particular locus, we can say that the SNP that has an overlap with something that's agreeing with a global picture is more likely to be the causal one. Great. So we are at 58.37050. So we can now use this to say, okay, let's now combine this prior that comes from the epigenomic annotations with the evidence that comes from the GWAS summary statistics to start building a posterior probability that a particular variant is causal. So we're basically gonna be combining information from number one, the prior of where does the SNP sit? And that is not just a random prior, it's an empirical prior that, observe, that is derived from the global enrichments. And then the evidence in any one locus to then say, based on the initial score of all of these variants, what is the posterior probability with which each of these variants is predicted to be the causal one, okay? So this is now taking the hundreds of SNPs that sit in these schizophrenia loci or these Crohn's disease loci, and then prioritizing the ones that are showing both high likelihood based on the GWAS and high prior based on the epigenomic overlaps and therefore high posterior probability. Everybody here with me on how we combine the prior evidence that comes from this empirical genome-wide enrichment with the gene locus specific, the genetic locus specific overlap with the particular association to then look for a posterior probability for every SNP uh, in the genome. Great, so we are at 63, 32, 500. And when we do this, we basically find that the SNPs that are prioritized using this posterior probability approach in a method that uh, ULE in my group developed called Riviera, these SNPs are more likely to be evolutionarily conserved compared to just other SNPs that are simply prioritized directly by genome-wide association studies. And they're much more likely to be localized in EQTLs and in digital genome footprints. These are high resolution maps of DNA accessible sites and of uh, expression quantitative trait loci, okay? So this is now, you know, just one key idea for how we can now start systematically understanding these uh, loci. I, so this is, you know, uh, work that we did, you know, five years ago. And since then we have greatly expanded the number of epigenomes and also the types of analysis that we can do. So just a few weeks ago, we published this uh, new work on EpiMap, which is in many ways the uh, follower of the epigenome roadmap that is expanding from 127 epigenomes to 834 epigenomes. And that basically expanded this table that we had previously from 54 enriched GWAS traits to 534 enriched traits. And much more interestingly, we now have 30,000 genome-wide 
as, uh, associated variants that are lying in enriched enhancers. And that basically gives us many highly specific associations. And we can now take that network that I showed you earlier, mapping genetic variants and sorry, genetic traits through their variants with the enhancers that they overlap and start talking about cognitive traits such as schizophrenia, depression, neuroticism, uh, educational attainment, uh, some measures of intelligence, math, uh, highest math class taken, et cetera, to enhancers that are active in the brain. Uh, a lot of monocyte, blood-related traits, immune traits, et cetera, to enhancers that are active in immune cells and so on and so forth. The other thing that we're able to see is traits that are extremely polyfactorial. These are traits that have many, many different enrichments. And what we can actually start doing now is partitioning all of the genetic loci associated with these traits into the specific tissues that they overlap. So one of the exciting things is not just saying, oh, great, there's one tissue that overlaps, but to say that, well, in some cases, there are multiple tissues that overlap in a significant fashion, these uh, coronary artery disease associated uh, SNPs. And we can now start partitioning all of the genetic loci into the ones that overlap liver or the ones that overlap coronary artery, the ones that overlap thyroid, adipose tissue, and so on and so forth. And what we're finding very interestingly is that the biological functions associated with these loci are dramatically different enabling us to partition these very complex traits into their simpler components. And we can do this also at the level of individual loci by asking if I go down the list of genome-wide significant loci with their p-value for each of those. And then I ask, what are the distances between the SNP that lies in this location and the enhancers that are active in these tissues. And those distances are sometimes as short as 30 nucleotides or 1.1 thousand nucleotides or 2.3 thousand nucleotides. So that allows you to now start prioritizing loci that overlap directly or loci that are sometimes far away. And there are some cool examples that actually highlight the multifactorial, the, you know, uh, the, the complex um, nature of coronary artery disease with some loci that overlap liver, others that overlap heart, and others that overlap both. And just to walk you through this picture, these are the same GWAS summary statistics that we saw earlier. These are the Manhattan plots, but zoomed in to these loci. And then you can find places where there's a single SNP, a single nucleotide variant, that is very, very strongly associated, whereas all the other ones are kind of lower. And that SNP here overlaps specifically a liver enhancer and is actually linked to the promoter of the SPCSK9 gene, which has been shown to be a very reliable uh, drug target against coronary disease. Here's another example where instead of one SNP and one association, we now have two loci one here and another one there that appear to be independently associated, but both of which are actually predicted to be linked to this heart associated gene. And here's another one where you see these very large number of SNPs, all of which fall in trait relevant enhancers and all of which are linked to the same two genes, one expressed in the heart and one expressed in the liver, okay? So who's following me here on this whole concept of taking these complex traits, partitioning them into SNPs, and then going down the, the, the list of loci and looking at loci that overlap with different classes of enhancers and then linking those to their target genes. So 62, 31, 080. So um, the other thing that we can do is now ask not just can I take existing loci and prioritize causal SNPs between them? But we can also take new loci that do not reach genome-wide significance. So here is the 10 to the minus, you know, 5 times 10 to the minus 8 
genome wide significance threshold. That's the dotted line at the top of the red square. And then anything that's above it is genome wide significant. That's basically saying there are many loci associated with heart repolarization in this particular example that are rising to genome wide significance. Can we now focus on the ones that don't quite rise to genome wide significance and then use the same approach of we have the likelihood coming from genome wide association studies and then we have a prior that comes from the enrichments of the genome wide significant ones that allows us to now start prioritizing sub threshold loci that are sometimes three orders of magnitude less significant than genome wide significance. So to do this, we basically used a machine learning approach that allowed us to predict which SNPs are more likely to be genome wide significant and then use those features as predictors to prioritize sub threshold variants. And you can see some of those are, you know, 10 to the minus five. This is three orders of magnitude less than the 10 to minus eight, less significant than 10 to the minus eight. So, and indeed many of those show additional lines of evidence when we went and tested them experimentally. So using Lucifer as reporters or three dimensional chromatin con conformation capture, we can actually see that many of these are in fact linked indeed to target genes that make a lot of sense. And if you look globally, you see that the genes that are predicted as targets in the subthreshold loci are very strongly enriched for a related genome-wide association study. This initial study was for the QT interval. There's different time points of heart repolarization. There's Q, R, S, T, and so on and so forth, where the heart repolarizes. And then QRS is a different interval. And indeed, many of those are very strongly enriched. And if you look at cardiac conduction and contractility phenotypes upon deletion of these genes in mouse phenotypes, you see again that the genes that are prioritized using this approach are very strongly enriched. And then we took two of those genes and we you know, did morpholino knockdowns of their function. And we saw that indeed we, could, we were able to change the heart repolarization duration of these genes, even though in some cases they're a thousand times further than genome-wide significance, okay? So who's with me on this concept that we can not only understand known loci, but we can also actually discover novel loci by learning features in the genome-wide significant ones and then applying these features to prioritize the sub-threshold loci. Awesome. Okay, so 72, 28, 000. Um, so uh, who feels that they have learned something today? So let's switch polls here. Who feels that they've learned something? Awesome. Let's see. Very cool. So 42, 42, 11, 0, 5. And then in terms of speed, how is the pace so far? Am I going too fast, just right, too slow? Awesome. Okay, so about 50% are saying just right and uh, quite a few people, you know, slightly too fast and almost no one is saying too slow. Okay, so uh, let's now switch to EQTLs. So we've basically talked about just a quick summary of how do we dissect these loci mechanistically and then how do we use global enrichment through epigenomics to infer relevant tissues, cell types, and target genes. Now let's dive a little bit more into the target genes by looking at expression quantitative trait loci. So the idea here is instead of looking at disease as the ultimate phenotype, which is a global organismal phenotype, we're now gonna be looking at expression as the intermediate phenotype. We're going to be looking at intermediate molecular phenotypes to disease. The idea is that we want to bridge the gap between genetic variation and disease. And that is a very, very long gap. There are thousands of genetic variants that contribute extremely slowly, extremely lowly 
to disease. And instead of looking at that very large gap, we're going to say, well, let's focus on specific tissues, let's focus on specific epigenomic mechanisms, specific gene expression changes, and specific endophenotypes that we can measure within the body rather than who has Alzheimer's. And then we might be able to say that the SNP affects specifically the brain and specifically an enhancer inside the brain and specifically the expression of a gene downstream of that enhancer and specifically amyloid beta and ultimately disease. So the, the, the challenge of course is that many of these intermediate phenotypes might actually be a consequence of the disease rather than a cause of the disease. And many others might be simply a cause of environmental changes that affect both the disease and the gene expression patterns. Others might actually be combating the disease. So they might actually be increasing expression to fight against the disease and therefore manipulating them might actually make things worse rather than make things better. And others might simply be correlated rather than causally related. So we're going to have a guest lecture today on causal, causality inference. But what we can also do is utilize the unidirectional arrows of genetic variants acting on those traits to infer which of these are a consequence of the genetics versus which of these are a consequence of the disease. And specifically, we're going to be looking at how genetic alterations correlate with epigenomic and transcriptional changes, how those correlate with disease, and how we can combine the two to actually study causality. The first step is going to look at how genetic variation correlates with epigenetic variation. And that's the basis of quantitative trait loci. So specifically expression QTLs or methylation QTLs. The key idea is the following. Instead of measuring uh, Alzheimer's or not, we're going to measure a quantitative trait. So that's the QT part, quantitative trait. We're going to measure a quantitative trait such as, say, height. And we're going to ask how many copies of the A or G allele do I have? Am I homozygous AA, heterozygous AG, or homozygous GG? And based on the genotype of the person, I might ask, what is the height of that person? And that is a quantitative trait. But instead of using an organismal quantitative trait, I'm going to use an intermediate molecular trait, namely the level of expression of a gene or the level of methylation of a CPG site. So the, the whole basis of expression quantitative traded loci or methylation quantitative trait loci is that I'm going to be looking for SNPs whose value, whose number of alternate alleles, for example, if it's zero, one, or two, is in fact correlated with the level of methylation or the level of expression of a gene nearby. So let's see who is with me so far. Perfect. So uh, 58, 42, 0, 0, 0. And, and indeed, we're finding tens of thousands of those methylation QTLs. These are places where if I know the genotype of that person at conception, I can predict with pretty high confidence the epigenome of that person at 93 years of age in their brain after they're dead, which is quite remarkable. That also means that I can now start imputing these intermediate molecular phenotypes. So I can learn a methylation QTL that allows me to predict the methylation from the genetics. And I can use that to now start predicting methylation and then correlating that methylation with disease. So let's review briefly. Genome-wide association studies are looking at this very, very long arrow between genetic variation and disease. And that requires tens of thousands of individuals in order to be able to discover these very subtle effects. 
what methylation QTLs and expression QTLs are doing is limiting the number of individuals to only a few hundred rather than many thousands. And that allows us to now start looking at the relationship with an intermediate molecular phenotype. Why is that feasible? Because there are only so many genetic variants that affect the activity of that enhancer. These are very localized surrounding that enhancer. And same for, thing for this gene. Yes, sure, maybe there's 20 variants, but there aren't a thousand variants. And these 20 variants are very localized in the genome, enabling us to have more power without having to test every single SNP like we do in the case of disease. So by bridging that gap into these intermediate steps, we're effectively making these traits more oligogenic. Instead of being extremely polygenic, they're now more oligogenic. So that allows us to now carry out this EQTL analysis with fewer individuals. Who's with me on these parts? The, the subtlety between GWAS and QTL analysis and the much more oligogenic nature and the fact that these effect sizes tend to be bigger and therefore I can have more power to discover them and therefore I need smaller cohorts to discover them. Okay, we're at 72, So, this is the first two, from G to disease and from genetics to intermediate molecular phenotypes. This can be methylation, expression, or you name it. Now, just like a GWAS, genome-wide association studies looking at the correlation with disease and genetics, an MWAS, a methylome-wide association study, is looking at the correlation between disease and methylation. But while the arrow for disease is unidirectional, namely an inherited variant is likely to not be a consequence of the disease, but instead a cause of the disease, a correlation between methylation and disease is much more likely to be a bidirectional arrow where disease might be causing the methylation difference, just like the methylation difference might be causing the disease. However, for imputed methylome-wide association studies, the imputed methylation is the genetic component of methylation. And therefore, if I find a correlation between imputed methylation and disease, it's much more likely to be a unidirectional arrow to disease. So the key idea is that we're gonna learn a G2M model using fewer individuals and a simpler phenotype. We're gonna impute methylation for the full GWAS cohort because all I need is the genetics of that person and therefore, if I can do it for 74,000 here, I can do it for 74,000 here since I only need genetics. And then we're gonna look for genotype driven methylation and the correlation of that with the phenotype, for example, Alzheimer's disease. And the advantage is we have much larger cohorts and increased power. And we're looking specifically at the genetic component. And of course, there's a logistical challenge, which is that Sometimes we only have summary statistics. We don't have full genotypes. So we're gonna look at ways that we can overcome this using linear uh, models and by imputing these statistics directly in a few slides, okay? So who feels that they're uh, learning something? Okay, so we're at 5638006. Okay, so here are some results for this imputed methylene water association study, where in a locus that doesn't have any genome wide significant hits, you can see here 10 to the minus 2, 10 to the minus 4, 10 to the minus 6, 10 to the minus 8 would be up there, but this entire chromosome has no genome wide significant hits we are finding that many of these SNPs that were not genome-wide significant are now becoming significant when using them to predict methylation and then correlating the methylation. How is that even possible? If it was just a single SNP and a linear model, then I wouldn't need to go through all this. But the, the situation is that we now have multiple SNPs that together allow us to predict methylation. 
and therefore we can combine their effects guided by the methylation association. Number two, we're looking at a much smaller subset of SNPs, namely only the ones that affect methylation. And therefore we have many fewer hypotheses to correct for. So that basically boosts up our signal to discover additional uh, driver variants. And we can do this through genetics, to methylation, to transcription, to disease, and then study confounders and how they're affecting each of those relationships. And then using all that, we can now start predicting mediators of the disease phenotype. We can basically say which genes are the first responders in a way to the genetic impact, the first impact of the genetic variation, which are then mediating the effect of that genetic variant or, or that combination of genetic variants on disease. And we're finding those both in genome-wide significant loci in purple, as well as in loci that do not reach genome-wide significance in isolation that are shown here in gray. And th this general methodology of looking at intermediate phenotypes is in fact something that has been extremely well studied. And there's a lot of models for doing these expression quantitative trait locus studies. So, you know, you're basically isolating cells, you're measuring the expression, and then you're looking at the expression of thousands of genes across hundreds of subjects. And then you're also measuring the DNA variation across those individuals. And you're doing all kinds of quality control assessments, basically look at the uh, genotype of each person. And then you're, you're basically asking how many copies of the A allele or the G allele do I have at every location. But notice here, I'm not just at zero, one, or two copies. I've number one, normalized it to be between zero and one. And number two, it's a fuzzy measurement. It's not exactly zero, one, or two. And the same thing we saw here when we're asking what is the relationship between genotype and methylation. It wasn't just everything at zero, everything at one, everything at two. The reason for this is that we're actually correcting for all kinds of additional variables such as population effects, such as uh, you know batch effects, all kinds of additional global drivers of variation. And therefore, the, re the residual values that we're showing here are not necessarily 0, 1, and 2. They are, uh, the, they are the residuals, which can be fractional values. Okay, And we're doing this both on the genotype side and on the phenotype side after we're doing all these corrections. And then ultimately, an EQTL study is simply a linear regression where we're asking, how can I predict expression as a function of genotype and some covariates. And those covariates can be age, sex, population stratification, all kinds of technical covariates and so on and so forth. And then ultimately, we're going to be asking, is this curve following this expected versus observed quantile quantile plot, this QQ plot, and basically telling us, is the statistic well calibrated? And how many SNPs deviate from that expectation, enabling us to now start predicting genetic drivers of these intermediate molecular phenotypes like expression, methylation, so on and so forth. And then we can annotate, visualize, and interpret the results. At the basis of all this is this very simple regression model, which is basically saying, what is my expression level for that individual in that gene as a function of a baseline plus some linear beta effect size of the genotype and some residual error. So we're going to be predicting our phenotype, which is going to be expression, as alpha, which is the baseline, plus beta 1 with genotype. And then we're going to add all of the additional covariates as additional regressors, beta 2 with gender, beta 3 with age, you know, and then all kinds of principal components for the genotypes of those individuals, which can tell us about the country of origin and can tell us about sort of global uh, phenotype, global genotype uh, provenance, and some expression principal components that are basically telling us that 
For example, PC1 might be what day of the week did I do the experiment? PC2 might be who in my lab did the experiment? PC3 might be how much um, bisulfide conversion did I have in my methylation array? Uh, PC4 can be how long did I sequence these uh, reads and so on and so forth. Okay, so that's where we're putting all of these uh, genotype principal components and expression principal components. So we're basically asking is a model that includes these additional covariates and that includes the genotype more able to explain the phenotypic variable of expression than just the baseline model. So this is at the foundation of an, ex an expression quantitative trait locus study. And we can complement this with allelic analysis. What is this doing? It's basically saying, instead of just asking for every individual, what is the, for an AA individual and a CA individual and a CC individual, what is the total gene expression? And that's basically the basis of an EQTL, an expression quantitative trait locus. Instead, what we can ask is for an AC individual that actually has both alleles represented in every one of their cells. If I partition the reads from that individual into the reads containing one allele with an A versus the other allele with a C from the same cell of the same person, then based on the linkage disequilibrium haplotype blocks that are co-inherited across this entire locus, I can basically say that, wow, I can associate the A genotype with the allele specific expression of this allele that appears to have a higher expression than that other allele, okay? So instead of asking what is the total expression for AA versus CA versus CC individuals, I'm only going to be looking at heterozygous individuals and then comparing the expression of one of their copies, let's say from mom that gave me the A versus from dad that gave me the C. Who's with me here on allele specific, oops, sorry, on allele specific um, analysis of uh, the genotype effects? So instead of just looking for the global effect of AC versus CC individuals, I'm going to be looking for the allele specific effect for that individual. Uh, that is heterozygous, where both alleles exist in the exact same uh, locus. Okay, so we're at 50%, 44, 6, and then 0, 0, which is great. Um, so basically we're gonna be taking our samples, extracting RNA and DNA, and then phasing the haplotypes and then separating the reads into allele one and allele two, and then looking for allele specific expression, but also combining all the reads together and then looking for uh, the total expression. And we're gonna be distinguishing these reads within the same heterozygous individual to distinguish allele specific effects. And then of course, I don't have to only use genotype specific effects and allele specific effects in isolation. I can also combine them. I can basically say for any particular region that I'm testing, given a particular SNP. So this is the SNP. This is the phenotypic measurement. I can ask what is the total read depth for AG versus GG versus AA individuals. And I can also ask what is the allelic imbalance between G and A for those heterozygous individuals. And we're going to be maximizing the likelihood of two different observed components. One of them is going to be based on the total read depth, and that's going to be the QTL effect, which is going to be asking, you know, what is the probability using a beta negative binomial of observing the, you know, particular um, read expression globally using the genotype of the individual and the specific parameters. And the other one is going to be an allelic imbalance using a beta binomial distribution. And again, the corresponding uh, global parameters. And we could also ask for response QTLs, which are asking about the uh, QTLs in response to a particular environmental condition. 
So for example, SNP2 might not be an NQTL or SNP1 might not be an NQTL and SNP2 might be an NQTL, uh, which is always there and always not there. But then SNP3 might be a response EQTL, which is that it only becomes an EQTL in response to a particular stimulus. So that basically says only when the cells are activated in response to an immune challenge, do I then see a difference in expression between the GG and the GA uh, and the AA uh, genotype. Okay, so that's another important concept to have, which is that those EQTLs are not necessarily always there. They might only be present in the in the context of a particular uh, association. So. Uh, Yongjin, if you're there, can you please turn on your video so I can see you uh, at the top and maybe even raise your hand. And, oh, um, oh perfect, you're here, awesome. So, um, as promised, we're going to transition halfway to uh, Yongjin's lecture, and then we're going to uh, pick up these additional topics at the beginning of the Thursday lecture. So, just to uh, recap, what we talked about is, number one, a review of GWAS and how do we mechanistically dissect loci? And then number two, we looked at global enrichment analysis through epigenomics and these uh, tissue specific enrichments and these regulator specific enrichments and target genes and cell types that are relevant to the disease. And then we looked at expression quantitative tra trait loci and these intermediate molecular phenotypes. So what Yongjin will uh, talk about now is how do we now take these methodologies and start looking at causality inference? How can we infer which of these uh, loci are in fact playing a causal role on the disease versus which ones are simply correlated with the disease phenotypes? So Yongjin, take it away. You're muted. Okay, oh. you just unmuted. Okay. Uh, should I share, share my screen or? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Okay. Uh, yeah, it's nice to see everybody. Um, yeah. So, so we'll be talking about the causality. So the one thing I just want to briefly mention the causality question has been around with us a long time. So nearly a hundred years. So this is a kind of the one example, the, the Koch postulate, basically, how do you prove the such a <clears throat> microorganisms are causing disease? That's how uh, you know, these guys came up with this criteria to make sure that the, what they claim is really causal. Um, the, <clears throat> surprisingly, all these things uh, capture all the concepts of causality pretty well. So, which actually was uh, interesting to me. And then also, it also means that uh, somehow uh, scientists are already very good at uh, defining causality. So they know what they're looking after. Um, but the, somehow machine learning people tend to ignore uh, that aspect, they think that you know data can speak for everything, but which is not necessarily true. So that's why I want to uh, bring in this uh, lecture. Uh, causal inference is somehow something we already know, uh, but uh, causal inference tell you the you know how do you ask the causal questions in a more formal way from the data. That's a kind of the uh, the, the direction. <clears throat> so the causal inference is a kind of broad uh, literature. Uh, there are two uh, broad categories. Uh, one is a causal effect literature. The other one is a causal discovery literature. So what I mean by causal effect is basically you have a causal model that's uh, maybe scientists will come up with to, uh, some sort of causal graph X to Y. And the, the whole purpose is to measure the, the, <clears throat> the tau, the causal effect which is a sort of came formulated as a parameter using the data matrix. And the causal discovery is a, a little harder because uh, you're only given with the input data, but the output you are required to capture, <clears throat> estimate somehow what's the causal relationship between those variables. So they're two different, uh, but the, this I'll be more focusing on the causal effect inference. So causal effect inference, so there are two uh, major two camps of the researchers. Um, they, um, they're essentially 
the same spirit, uh, but uh, they have a different terminology, different jargons. So the one I call is an experimentalist. They are relying on the interventions and experiments. So the other camp is uh, relying on the counterfactual reasoning. So experimentalist is what they're asking for is uh, some sort of operation. If you set some variable x to x, uh, what would happen to the, the outcome variable y? That's their question. So the, the whole direction of the research is how do you make sure that uh, your conditional probability is uh, almost equivalent to your uh, interventional probability. And the counterfactual reasoning is uh, a little more philosophical. What they're asking is uh, what if we had uh, set x to one or, and or versus x to zero, what's the difference of the outcome? That's what they're asking for. So these are the people who, are, who actually pioneered the work. So the causal inference uh, first strategy is uh, in, uh, we're gonna look at is a experimentalist approach, uh, which is actually more familiar to us because it's really relying on the graph <clears throat> terminology. So say that your causal relationship is uh, X to Y, um, then we, they usually <clears throat> represent their causal relationship uh, by graph X arrow to Y, X causes Y which is actually different from the probability <clears throat> of y given x, <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> and then the, another concept is uh, you have to, we have to uh, sort of introduce is a uh, reachability. So from the variable x to z, there's a reachable reachability based uh, on this causal graph. So another concept is uh, they introduced is a uh, conditioning and adjustment. So the, what I mean by conditioning is uh, you set some value to uh, random variable y, for example. So the, this is a basic review The I can just quickly go over. So the another concept the, to, to test the reachability, you, they introduced a D separation, which is, uh, can you reach from the variable X to Z uh, using the, on this causal graph? So if you don't have anything observed in the middle, so yes, X to Y, X to Z, there is a dependency. And then uh, also the Y is also common cause. Then it, it's also the, between X and Z, there are also dependency. However, the other structure is uh, it's opposite, which is we call it a uh, collider. So X and Z are actually independent uh, if you don't observe the Y. So that's a, <clears throat> that's a uh, V structure. So it, it's the opposite. But if you condition uh, Y, some, the variable in the middle, then uh, X to Z, you are blocking the way in this linear chain. So common cause case is also the same. If you condition on Y, your variable X and Z are independent. So, however, the other case, uh, collider, which is a, your, your sharing common effect. If you condition Y, then X and Z are becoming dependent. So conditionally dependent. So these are the co uh, common rules, but you can extend this uh, <clears throat> common effect in the more uh, deeper case. So if you have a descendants of your common effect is conditioned, then X and Z are uh, dependent, conditionally dependent. <clears throat> so using this <clears throat> causal inference method, we can actually ask um, some causal <clears throat> causal graphical language, you can actually ask the causal questions. So here are the four steps I sort of lay out. First, we need to build a causal model, which is actually coming from uh, your domain knowledge. In this case, uh, Sewell Wright, and he actually first came up with this graphical language. So using uh, for, to study his genetic analysis of the guinea pigs fur color. Um, then the second step is, uh, so what's causal versus what's, what's anti-causal given your causal structure model? This is actually a key component of this causal inference. So say that you're interested in uh, uh, identifying causal effect from X to Y, which is a green arrow, but uh, there is also possibility that there's anti-causal path, which uh, we, we usually call it backdoor path. So because of this backdoor path, your uh, interpretation of the conditional probability is not equal to the um, probability of Y given do of X, interventional probability. So that's, that actually creates your correlation is not causation. 
So the, um, usually in the backdoor path, there is a backdoor variable that uh, somehow if you can condition on those backdoor variables wisely, then you can block the backdoor path that actually helps you identify uh, front door path X to Y. So how do you do that? The, it's a, it's the, all the graphical concepts that I introduce uh, which is this separation. We, if you deseparate uh, X to Y, except for the front door path, uh, then you can actually block the backdoor variable. So it's a kind of a exercise. Uh, so say that you're interested in X to Y, then what are the back, backdoor variables? So we are basically looking, starting from backwards. So Y to X, what could be potential uh, backdoor path other than the, your front door path? So, so the, then if you condition on something, then can I block this backdoor path? That's, a, that's a basically the co common question of the methodology. Um, then say that you condition on C4 in this case, then uh, this you create the, um, the collider pattern. So the, the problem with the collider pattern is if you condition on C4, then you create another path. So that's why you need to condition on something else. So in this case, if you block C2, then you can block the, all the backdoor path. Then you can identify your probability of y, uh, y given x do over x is equal to this conditional probability. So in this case, what you're doing is actually releasing what you're observing. So that, that's how you can identify your causal uh, effects. So there are other, other possibilities exist. So, but you have to be careful about the directionality of this uh, graphical model. So if you uh, look at the directionality, so if you, in this case, if I just flip the directions from the previous example, then there is no, uh, no need to worry about the backdoor path because the, the, these are all uh, collider patterns. So in this case, if you're conditioning on something, then you're creating a bias. So, um, so the problem is that in, in the real case is that we don't have enough knowledge of these backdoor variables. So uh, for example, complex disease to uh, complex uh, gene expression patterns, for example, we, don't, we, 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 we do not have all the environmental effect, the genetic effect that may influence both complex disease and gene expression. So, so that, that gives uh, us a research question. So another biggest problem is, uh, uh, is uh, sometimes that the variables you can observe, environmental factors, they can be also collider too. So that means uh, if you don't condition on collider, you, you don't create backdoor path. But if you condition on collider, then you are creating another backdoor path, which actually cause a problem. So how do we actually adjust confounders only uh, not touching the collider. That's, a, that's the actual key question on the research. So, so how, do, how do we do that is basically uh, in practice, if your variable is simple enough and then you can make intervention, uh, you can uh, design your experiment wisely, then we can randomly assign X to some X star, then you can actually break the dependency between uh, confounder to X variable. Then you can actually measure the effect of do x equals x star and the y is your outcome effect. So this was actually coined by uh, uh, you know, Ronald Fisher a long time ago. Um, he uh, coined this uh, randomized control trial concept when, while he was doing experiment on the uh, plotting of the agriculture experiment. And he basically randomly assigned the uh, fertilizers uh, different plots. And then you can actually measure the unbiased estimation of the causal effect. So, the, so the so in in our genomics question, uh, the problems are actually sometimes it gets compli more complicated, but sometimes it gets easier. So the, the reason is the genetics. We have another variable which is G that gives you a good handle. How do we uh, to uh, understand the X causes to Y? This is a lot looks like a mediation problem. So the, the benefit of G uh, having genetics, inherited genetic variable is there's no uh, genetic effect that affects G. And there's no uh, environmental effect to genetic, uh, inherited genetic variable path. So that gives us uh, almost like a do operation. So 
G genetic, inherited genetic variable is nature's uh, randomized control trial. So if you set uh, G to some G star, then you can actually measure this. So this actually opens a new door for many of the questions. So, so in many cases, a do of uh, X equals to some X in the intermediate uh, layers, it's sometimes it's, it's unethical. So if, you, if you knew that this is potentially disease causing gene, you don't want to introduce mutations. Uh, sometimes also it's impossible because the, these variables are uh, hard to manipulate in, in real life. And also it, you, you, even if you could do that, so it's really difficult to design a randomized experiment that you can actually uh, do, uh, do operation on the X variable directly. But uh, with the help of genetics, you can actually uh, read, uh, just assign this. So the, let me skip this. Yeah, this is a kind of the idea of the uh, Mendelian randomization idea. So the, it was already coined a long time ago, 1951 uh, by Fisher. The genotypes are, they're beautifully randomized. So the so inherited genetic genotypes are not altered by any environmental factors of the upstream. So using this, uh, you know, mentioned that, uh, uh, Professor Kelsey mentioned that there was uh, some in, imputed uh, mediation studies. So we can actually take over, uh, you know, learn some relationship between genotype to the intermediate phenotypes. And then we can actually understand the relationship between, inter between the intermediate phenotype and the and, uh, uh, final phenotype, disease phenotypes. So the, the Mendelian randomization is a, a special case of so, uh, that using uh, nature's do operation. Um, so it was a po heavily popularized by uh, George Dave Smith. Uh, he basically showed that the uh, genotype, if you know the genotype to phenotype, the, the disease phenotype, and if you know the genotype to intermediate phenotype, then you can actually estimate this, uh, what's missing in the middle of the entire chain. So using the, re the relationship between GWAS and the relationship between the EQTL, for example. So the, what, what another history is uh, the same concept was actually coined by uh, long, uh, some medical doctor uh, in uh, 1986. So that's uh, one, of, one of the oldest, oldest example that he showed that the, he, using APOE uh, protein sequence, which is almost equivalent to genotype, um, then he showed that, that there's a relationship between the serum cholesterol and then cancer risk. Um, so the idea is uh, very simple. However, there's some, uh, it's heavily affected by assumptions because as you know, this causal graph, if you know the alternate path, then you're violating a Mendelian randomization assumptions, which, may, which means uh, you're not really, uh, this, the beta you can estimate from these two uh, relationship is not truly the causal effect. So however, the Mendelian randomization has been successfully applied in uh, gene, uh, EQTL and GWAS integration studies as well. So if you know the GWAS, some SNP to disease and SNP to expression, EQTL, then the, the estimation is extremely simple actually. So you just divide the GWAS effect, again, uh, divided by EQTL effect, and that gives you the, the mediation effect of the SNP. Um, and uh, as you can see in this example, uh, EQTL effect and GWAS effect, uh, the, the slope is basically capturing the uh, genes effect on the disease in this example. So this is also very uh, highly robust uh, across many SNPs. So the, yeah, this is a, another way you can do it. It's a, it's a lot similar to imputed studies. You can first do the regression uh, Y on G and then another regression X on G, and then you can combine them with the uh, Y and X plus G. Then you can estimate the beta uh, with the regression parameter. And the mediation effects, uh, the social science that people develop is mostly alpha times beta in this causal chain. Uh, then they estimate the standard error. This is also another classic paper of the mediation. <clears throat> 
So the so far we've looked at the why uh, you know Mendelian renderization makes sense, and then uh, and then it's a lot sim also similar to uh, Mendel uh, randomized control trial, the actual randomized control trial, um, because the nature actually gave us somehow the genotype random randomly controlled uh, genotypes that actually randomly perturb your intermediate variables, and that gives you the a way to randomize control trial on the disease outcome, for example. Okay, so the 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 challenge of the MR uh, Mendelian randomization study is basically it's usually very difficult uh, when you have uh, alternate path. So we, if you don't know the problem well, then Mendelian randomization can be uh, misleading somehow. Uh, if you don't know the unknown confounders or whether the unknown confounder is a collider between the X and Y and a collider between G and X, then in that case, it's, uh, you don't know whether you should uh, adjust that or whether you should just leave it. It's, it's unclear. That's another research question that you have to be careful. And the, uh, another second uh, challenge, I think it's, uh, it's, one, it's heavily related to my own research is uh, in many cases, we, we have EQTL study and a GUA study in a separate uh, cohort. So, which means there's no uh, confounder in many cases. However, uh, between many multiple mediator variables, multiple axes, and the multiple phenotypes wise, there is an unknown confounder, which actually creates a bigger problem. So the reason is, if you somehow condition on the intermediate variable X, then it's a, it sort of creates a collider structure. That means you're, very, you're, uh, you're, cre you're creating backdoor variable, then your uh, MR approach is not valid in this case. And like the same way for if you condition on some, some phenotype, then you create another backdoor, then you it, it creates a problem. That's another challenge of the Mendelian randomization approach. So the, the second approach I will introduce is uh, for the causal effect inference is uh, the Rudin's causal inference model. So which is uh, the previous one of mostly graphical approach. It's been heavily used in the epidemiology and uh, many people. And the second approach is less uh, used in the genomics community. So it's, which is a counterfactual reasoning. So it's basically asking the question, what if we uh, had some assigned some value to a different value than you observed. So here the notation is uh, why is your disease uh, gene expression or disease outcome something you're interested in. And then the W is your assignment. So disease assignment one, disease assignment zero. In that case, uh, you, would you would want to observe both for the same individual. So same individual you could uh, have if you had assigned W equal to Z one, then you would observe this. If you had assigned W equals to zero, then you would have this. So, so this is a, the formal of uh, definition of a Rudin's uh, potential outcome framework, which actually gives uh, a way to measure causal effect when your assignment is a sort of discrete variable. So you have X uh, covariates, which is, could be potentially compounding. And then you have assignment variable, which is WI, I denoted. Uh, zero means control, one means active. Uh, YI is your observed outcome of the unit I. So in definition of the potential outcome is a, is a potential outcome under your uh, control assignment. It's a potential outcome under your uh, you know, case assignment. So the, it essentially creates a, a, a sort of imputation problem because you have a say that you have a six individuals and then you have uh, originally assigned zero, one, one, zero, zero, one, something like that. And then your potential outcome for uh, zero for this first individual is uh, actually the what you observed. However, you have a counterfactual uh, outcome you, you could not observe at all which is Y1, uh, which is uh, unknown, that's uh, missing. And on the other case, the second individual, it's the opposite. So at least the half of your values uh, are actually missing if you wanted to ask a true causal questions. 
So if a disease assignment is one, then your y i observed one is actually y i one. Y i missing is y i zero. So, and then vice versa for healthy control. So ideally you will want to observe the difference of each individual. So uh, assign one and assign zero, the difference is your causal effect, individual causal effect. So this, um, then the, yeah, and then technically it's impossible to fill in everything. So without any assumption. So we have to give some assumption. So first you, you will assume that the, uh, it's independent. Uh, everything is, uh, every unit is independent from the other unit. Uh, it's a more or less a IID condition of a causal inference. So it's a stable treatment. So my treatment to disease or my, or my treatment to disease uh, drug is actually independent of the, somebody else's uh, you know, assignment or all the values. And the second and the third assumptions are also very critical. So second assumption is strong ignorability, which is uh, what you uh, really assign is independent of your potential outcome. So, which means uh, your biological mechanism is independent of what you were assigned to. So if you, so that, that means biological mechanism is sort of robust against uh, your actually your assigned given this uh, covariance. Uh, and the overlap is a uh, sort of smoothness, which means uh, you, you will get the uh, uh, assignment for each uh, different covariate conditions. So that means uh, it's, it's not necessarily zero or one, it has to be somewhere in the middle. So using this assumption, we can actually ask uh, very interesting questions. So here's a kind of a cartoon, uh, the toy example that sort of demonstrate this uh, potential outcome method. So the say that you somehow your uh, assignment of your drug, so which is Alzheimer's disease drug, so it's sort of uh, assumed to reduce the amyloid beta protein. So then your assignment it becomes one. If you are somehow so, you know, if you are um, oh, okay, uh, yeah, if your covariate in this case is aging, if you're aging, if you're older people, then uh, medical doctors tend to prescribe more frequently to this uh, supplement. And your outcome is somehow the disease outcome effect tau, and then you also have uh, some aging effect on your outcome, on, on your, on your uh, the amyloid beta concentration. Um, the, let me skip this. However, in this uh, just fake example, the, if you just observe the correlation, uh, drug, treat, drug treated versus untreated, so your amyloid beta is increasing, which means uh, this drug seems useless. Uh, however, uh, the, the reason is uh, because you, your, the, the medical doctors tend to prescribe more frequently to uh, the patient for this drug. So, and then if you look at the relationship between the standardized age and then amyloid beta protein concentration, it tend to increase uh, just this big example. Um, the, then, then the causal inference uh, person came in and then the, uh, if you, first you have to look at the relationship between your age and then your assignment, you can see there's some bias and you can fit some propensity function, which is a, uh, basically logistic regression function. Uh, you, if you're older people, you tend to prescribe more frequently. So that's kind of the propensity that we want to adjust. Um, but the, yeah, and then if you look at the graph uh, with the colored uh, treated versus untreated groups, they are sort of linear relationship. However, there's some group wise difference. So the, if you had done a randomized control trial is definitely reducing uh, uh, the amyloid beta effect. And uh, here, this graph is actually teaching us a lot on this method. So the, basically you have a treated versus untreated groups, uh, differently colored, and then also on the axis of standard age and then the amyloid beta the outcome. Um, then it's immediately, you can tell that it's not fair to compare this point on this uh, right extreme versus the left extreme, uh, like case and control. You don't want to do that. It, it looks like you're comparing uh, apple to orange. So in, in that case, so 
you have to then you ask a counterfactual questions. So what would happen if you had randomly assigned the samples, randomly assigned the assi uh, drugs to the people? And then the one way to reverse this uh, relationship is using propensity scores. You can weight points differently. So you think that this point is uh, it's kind of extreme, but I think it's less important compared to the points here, compared to the points here and so on. So the mathematically, it's uh, very uh, intuitive. So you can see that uh, the average of the treated groups, W times Y divided by the propensity score inversely uh, uh, proportional to the propensity. So on the untreated ones, these the same way than the Theoretically, it reaches to the, uh, the potential outcome of the treated potential outcome of the average, average potential outcome of the untreated. So you can see the difference. So that's how we do it. Um, let me skip the, yeah, let me skip the, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, let me, let me skip the proof. Um, then the, yeah, the, Previously, we saw that the untreated groups somehow have a higher amyloid beta as, as it is. However, if you treat, uh, if you weight them, weight the points indifferently, you, you think that uh, this is actually very important compared to the somewhere in the middle. And this is also more important than the middle. Then you can see uh, the relationship is sort of recovered, uh, true relationships. So the, that's a kind of a flavor of the one causal inference uh, uh, by um, a potential outcome framework. Oops, oh, sorry. Why is it T O? Gosh. Okay, so sorry about that. Um, yeah, and then the, let me introduce some of the state of the art. The counterfactual inference is uh, like I mentioned that it's a more or less uh, imputation problem, like uh, previous uh, theoreticians thought in that way. So the basically filling in all these uh, question marks, and they um, it was actually recently got uh, in, in uh, a lot of interest from the machine learning community. This is one of the state of the art paper and the JASA. Um, it's basically GWAS uh, paper, and then they wants to show that the, the uh, can you somehow do causal GWAS. So um, basically uh, here A is an allele, so assignment of the cause. And then there's unknown confounder, which is U. They want to uh, remove this effect on the disease outcome. Um, this is a kind of special structure because we have a lot of call, potential call, causing variables and then the one outcome variable. Um, but the, their key idea is actually very simple. If you somehow do factorization of this, uh, assigned uh, variables, uh, which is a SNP matrix, basically, you can actually capture this uh, multiple multi-cause confounder. And by assumption, they think the single cause confounder is, uh, does not exist. That's their assumption. Given that uh, you can actually estimate the potential outcome of YA uh, on some, uh, as, a, as a function of the multi-cause confounder. But the, the, from the GWAS people, this is actually already something that we are already doing it. So I, I, think, I don't think it's a practical value in some sense. So, so but, but anyways, uh, what, what GWAS people are doing using uh, population PC uh, to adjust the potential confounding effect of the GWAS is uh, somehow it's, it also makes sense in the potential outcome framework. And the second, uh, strategy, it's actually more interesting. This is a very simple and well-written paper. Uh, basically, uh, since like I, like I alluded, everything is a sort of imputation problem. So given some confounding, uh, potential confounding variable, you want to impute this, uh, it, the potential outcome of one, and you also want to impute the potential outcome of zero. Uh, then this is a, you have to estimate two functions, function one and function two. Then using this, you can actually impute all this data. So directly impute the missing uh, potential outcomes. Uh, this actually works well. They use the Bayesian uh, uh, regression tree. Uh, and she used actually the Bayesian regression tree. And then as you can see, the, it, compared to the linear model, the, the purple lines, it's a lot better because you can actually 
to capture the complex curvature uh, of the data. And then using this, you can actually see each individual, which is each uh, basically bar, you can measure the individual causal effects. So the treated versus untreated and so on, treated versus untreated. So some, some individual may have a higher uh, treatment effect. Some may have lower, uh, some may have lower here. So this is actually a very nice way of uh, estimating the imputation problem in the potential outcome. So, so the, the, the beauty of this paper is actually, um, she actually includes some R code, which is just one line. Um, actually, it's a very nice. So yeah, you can just fit the Bayesian uh, regression tree using this uh, kind of code. And then you can estimate the difference between the uh, treated versus untreated in this case. You have to uh, customize to your own research for if you want to use this. Um, the, the last one, uh, let me, if I have time. So do I have time? So, Well, not really, but uh, you know, Folks can always sign off and uh, listen to the recording, I guess. Okay, so let me just finish this uh, just to be to be complete. Uh, so so far we have looked at the causal effect literature. Uh, the other aspect is a causal discovery, which is learning the causal graph structure from the data. So the a traditional approach, uh, I also devoted a lot of time for this uh, direction. Uh, which is basically you have a high dimensional data matrix and then you have a, some underlying causal model uh, that you have graph structure. And then we compare the probability of the basically likelihood of this, uh, your generated data given this uh, graphical model. Uh, and then you compare sort of uh, whether you can improve the score by changing the graph structure. This is a very, very difficult problem. It's a combinatorial optimization problem. So, and then someone actually proved that it's NP hard problem. Um, but uh, yeah, and then the, another issue is the, this uh, structure uh, may not be able to distinguish uh, in terms of the likelihood function itself because you don't have sufficient, you may not have a sufficient amount of data. You may only, or, or your model is not that well-defined. So in that case, there's no way to break the tie in this case. So the, in this case, in this structural learning uh, case, uh, I think that the breakthrough actually came from biology. So it's basically using the, the power of genetics. They uh, basically perturb all these genes and, uh, not, and then they measure the gene expressions. In this case, single cell, for example. And then you can have uh, all the count matrix for different uh, perturbation, con perturbation conditions. So using this, can, can you learn somehow the networks? So, so previously we had the uh, early 2000s, we have a gene expression matrix, uh, but after the sort of perturbseq was introduced, we can actually massively paralyze all the perturbations. And then we can also measure all those uh, matrices, multiple matrices. So that actually creates a very different settings for causal structural learning. So the, here is the, uh, the we, we sort of, these days the people are using different principle rather than the score based the likelihood uh, you know enumerate enumeration so the here is the uh, relying on the invariance condition which means that there is one only one causal model that actually generates the data uh, uh, but uh, all, all the different perturbation conditions however um, the structures remain uh, invariant so they're using that assumption they sort of use identify what's the causal structure of the data. This is actually the uh, Jonas Peters paper uh, from, uh, it's very nicely written. Uh, so you have a no perturbation, gene knockout two and three, gene knockout four, so and so on. So the, here's my this is toy example. So, so basically you have three experiments. So X, uh, gene X1 and X3 are perturbed, knocked down, knockout, uh, X4, X3, knockout, uh, X2, knockout. Using this uh, sort of perturbation study, can you recover your structure better? better? So, so then the, you start with a, some sort of a model. So in this case, my model is y equals x1 variable plus some epsilon. This is my model. So the question is, is this model invariant uh, uh, across different perturbation conditions? So 
So you have observation of y. If you have a perturbed this and that, you get the epsilon y uh, in the perturbed experiment two, and then you get this uh, uh, observation. And experiment three, you have observation this. So in this example, so experiment one, experiment two, experiment three, you have a y variable, and then the, and then see if your uh, your assumed model can explain your data consistently well or, or co consistently in the same way. So experiment one, you get this uh, epsilon y is uh, the no, no co predictor. And ex experiment two, you have x1, x1 that sort of cancels. Experiment three, x1, x1 cancels. So basically epsilon y sort of remains, which means it's a sort of your residual is uh, the same across different uh, perturbation conditions. So, so your invariant condition sort of satisfied. You cannot reject any of the experiment under your current model. Um, however, if you include uh, some wrong predictor, x3 in this case. So in this case, you have observation of y, x1, x3. We can do the same exercise. Uh, then you can see the, um, so, for experiment one and two, you basically have uh, the same uh, epsilon y is, is remaining as a residual. However, x1 uh, and x1, x1 cancels. However, for the experiment the three, you get to see some weird structure there. So your epsilon y will be canceled because you somehow include the y. Y is a actually descendant of x3. Uh, so that, that means, uh, that means you get the different residual. So then, then you can you have to reject this uh, experiment three. That means your model is not uh, invariant. So that that sort of principle. So uh, the second experiment is uh, yeah basically the same same idea. So somehow, uh, but uh, somehow this is not perfect because uh, somehow your your model may not be able to distinguish your invariance conditions. So in this case, you can still include x two. So, so however, in practice, this works really well. So they did actually uh, actual gene knockout experiment as a validation of the disease, uh, the prediction label. So they, they named it as a causal regression. So they, so they actually perturbed the gene expression and then what would happen to Y uh, compared to the other regression approach, uh, basically treating all the data as an observational data, not the perturbation data then you see the huge difference of the gap between the, the causal regression versus uh, you know, typical regression. So the more, more perturbation experiment, uh, you get definitely way, way, you get, you get to improve your model. So yeah, so, the, so that, that I, think, I think that was it. So, so I can briefly mention the causal triangulation. Um, so the recently the science TV community, there has been a lot of discuss about the uh, reproducibility. So, you know, George Dave Smith and Peter Lipton, they said that instead of reproducing the, repeating the same experiment, you have to do, uh, call, if you want to develop uh, some causal algorithm or causal discovery, then you have to have a multiple orthogonal evidence, which is a lot similar to what we have looked at on the uh, causation, uh, causal discovery by invariance condition. So if you're, if you're something is there, then it has to be invariant across different experimental conditions. Yep. So that, that, was, that, was, that was it. Great. So, thank, you. Yeah. thank you all for sticking around. And thank you, Youngjin, for a great lecture. Uh, let's do uh, one quick poll for those who stayed. And I just think, oh, well, I'm no longer logged in, so I'm not able to do that. All right. Thanks, everyone. And uh, please give a hand to uh, Youngjin for a great, great lecture. Thank you. All right, bye everyone.